and it's going to be announced in D2L. So tangent t, all right? Sine and cosine represent y and x coordinate respectively, right? On what circle? On the unit circle. Right? So on the unit circle here, x squared plus y squared equals 1. This is x-axis and this is y-axis. Then not only x-coordinate is related to cosine, things like that, x-coordinate is a cosine value, and y-coordinate is a sine value, right? So here's a t-radian, for example, like this. And there is this line, like that. There's x comma y. So we know the geometric meaning of cosine and sine value, x coordinate and y coordinate. How about tangent? Anybody know? The tangent is y over x, right? Anybody know the nice meaning of y over x for this for this line here? This line right here? What does y over x? Which is tangent t, right? What does that mean? You look at this line, think about this quantity y over x which is tangent. This is called S word. Slope. Right? This is 0 comma 0 and x if you can see you can look at this as y minus 0 x minus 0. Does it look like a slope formula? Between x comma y and 0 comma 0. So that's the slope. Now x coordinate represents cosine, y coordinate represents sine and what does tangent represent? Slope of the of that segment terminal side does that make sense so maybe m is a good word for that m again this is a functional relation no matter what that input is it can be represented x by x and no matter what the output is it's going to be y so they usually write y equal tangent x they don't usually write it like this but by writing it like this you understand you know, the context behind this function. Okay? X coordinate here is represented by the length of this side of the triangle. It's very nice. You can kind of see that, how long that is. So you don't need to calculate it. If you want to kind of measure it, draw a circle accurately, and then you can do that. And Y is represented by this length here. So if M is represented by length, that's the best way to visualize it, right? It took some time for you to understand the meaning of a slope, right? You have to practice a lot and you look at, look at lots of lines, right? Slope is a number. If you can translate a number and represent a number by length, and that's the best way. And here's a clever idea of doing this. Here is x coordinate. No. Is y coordinate unicircle again? For example, here is an angle like that. Here's angle T. And they want to come up with some nice way of representing the slope of that line right there, which is just ideal, right? Y over x. So they came up with this idea. This is a really pretty idea. Remember how I sketched the sign first time? I, I kind of translated this vertical segment over to the um, y graph. So I was able to see that how much the sign value is. But this is their idea. First you think about this long vertical line that starts at this, this point in here. And then they extend that terminal side like that until it meets this point right there. Okay. Then you know it doesn't matter which two point you choose on this line, this rise over run will remain the same. Do you believe that? If I have a line, if I choose these two points, rise over run versus these two points, rise over run, the ratio will be exactly the same. That is the foundation behind the definition of sine and cosine. This ratio is always the same, right? So, 
Um, I'm going to look at these two points then, and that's going to be the slope, right? But what is the run part here? If the slope here is m, I'm going to write that down. If the slope is really m, then that's going to be the tangent t, remember? That is the tangent t. And we want to, you know, visualize this quantity t as, as a length of something. This is a one unit because it's just, um, what is it? Unicircle, right? And what is it supposed to be? Rise over run is supposed to be m, right? Wherever you two points you look at. It doesn't matter this origin and the points on the unicircle or origin and points on that circle, the slope is exactly the same. Now if this is 1, what should be this one if the slope is m? Rise over run. This thing divided by 1 must be m, right? So what is this one? It's not a number, but it must be m, right? So m divided by 1 is m, and that's the only way. So if you extend it like this, the length of this side here nicely represents m, which is the value of tangent. So finally, this tangent t is represented by length of something. So without calculator, we can kind of roughly sketch what happens to graph of a tangent t. So here, I'm going to use one sample point, something that you might already know. How about tangent pi over 4? We entered this motion in real number, trigonometry function of real numbers. We'll never write down 45 degree here, but you think about 45 degree, pi over 4 is 45 degree. So tangent 45 degree. Remember the triangle? 45, 45? That pi over 4 is a 45 degree comes from this triangle, right? Remember those numbers around this triangle? 1, 1, root 2. So what do you say? Tangent pi over 4 is 1 divided by 1. So it's 1. Okay? That's what value is. Alright. But can you imagine a line with a 45 degree angle from the positive x-axis? Isn't that just that line right in the middle in the first first quadrant, right? Do you believe that's a 45 degree? And that's a slope 1, right? What kind of line is slope 1? What is the equation of that line? Slope 1. Y equals x. And that's exactly y equals x like that if that was a 45 degree, right? And that's a slope 1. That's what we're talking about. So here's a graph. This graph of tangent is more vertically stretched. What would you say about sine and cosine? It's kind of expanded over horizontally and it doesn't get too big, right? So here is, what is a vertical axis? M, slope, right? Horizontal axis is T angle and here's 0 when t equals 0 what do you say about t equals 0 this is about t equals 50 degree maybe in this picture do you see where that point is when t is 0 degree point at the circle point up there if t is at 0 degree where is that circle point as all the way down the next coordinate right so what would you say about the value of m there Maybe if t is 0, it's a horizontal line, right? What is the slope of a horizontal line? 0. So at t equals 0, it is 0. We have to put this big. That's the value of tangent 0 right there, right? What else do you know? What value do we know? Tangent of? We just did it. Pi over 4? Tangent pi over 4, we just did it here, right? Pi over 4. What is the value? 1, right? Pi over 4 is um, slightly smaller than 1, I think. So here's, maybe 1 is over here. That's the point right there. Alright? Now, I want you to think about tangent to 89 degree, right there. Tangent 89 degree. 
It's almost 90 degrees right there, right? So if the run part's one, what do you see the you know rise part if it is 89 degree? Somewhere of a height of the Empire State Building or something, right? It's going to be all the way up there. It's going to be a fairly large number, right? How about 89.9999? And you can see that it's almost parallel, but eventually it's going to meet somewhere over there in some galaxy, right? So that's that number that's what's happening. Slope is increasing arbitrarily large as it gets more and more vertical. So where is that angle? Pi over 2, right? 90 degree. It's exactly two times of it. You think about why I'm putting this big, long, vertical line. You know why? So if it is perfectly vertical there, 90 degree, what would you say about the slope? What is the slope? Infinite or undefined, right? It's not a number. So it's a pi over 2, 1, but as you put some number that is very close to pi over 2, which is t equals pi over 2 here, right? And at pi over 2, what happens? At pi over 2? Undefined, right? But right before pi over 2, what kind of number do you see? Large number, right? Astronomical number. So if you try more and more, turns out goes up like that, and the value is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we approach the closer and closer to pi over 2. What is this phenomenon called? There's this vertical line and the graph is getting arbitrarily close to the vertical line. What is that called? Right. There's a word to describe this phenomenon. Asymptote. Vertical asymptote. This is a line. Graph is getting close. It's called the vertical asymptotes. All right? So that's how it looks like. The other side is quite symmetrical. Ten, ten, I, I think I mentioned that we argued once. Tangent is even function or odd function? Or neither? It's an odd function. Sine is odd function. Cosine is even function. Sine divided by cosine becomes odd function. Right? And odd function has this property of this kind of symmetry. like that. That is, uh, the other side is t equals a negative pi over 2. Right? That's the negative 90 degree side. That is the graph. Okay? And what happened again at 90 degree slope? Undefined. That's why we have this one. But you can still go over there. Think about this side over here. This line. What would you say about the Rough estimate of your slope of this new line on the second quadrant, if you see. What would you say? Seems like negative 3. You know, run part negative 1, I go 1, 2, you know, 2.5, somewhere there. Negative number, right? These are negative number. And if you're over here, positive slope, right? Is a positive slope. They have all the slope defined. So no matter where you look at t's, there is some slope defined, but if you, you know, keep trying, it turns out they repeat exactly the same shape here. Exact same copies, over and over, to the left and right. You have to sketch this three copy, indicating that you understand what happened to the right or left. It's not just about that one central strip. There are infinite strip like this. This is a graph of what function? Tangent t. This is a graph of m equals tangent t. You're supposed to sketch that, right? With this vertical asymptotes. And what is a, you know, um, width of this strip? To the right pi over two, left negative pi over two. Length. Pi. Do you believe that? Pi over to this side, negative pi over to that side. So whole length is pi. Right coordinate minus left coordinate. That gives you pi. All right?
And I said, this one is exactly the same with copying over. Okay. So do you see that this shape of the graph repeated over and over over the uh, interval of length pi, right? When we looked at the sine and cosine graph, something like that happened. And what was the name of that length? What did we call something that repeats over and over? So, you know, the, the shape, the repeated shape is kind of cycle. And the time it takes to have that cycle is called a period. But this is not a motion, right? No motion actually looks like this. But um, graph kind of repeats the same phenomena. So the terminology is for the shape of the graph, we still say is a period, pi. Over here, over there, um, we have a period pi. So if you're anywhere in here, if you go pi units, you end up at exactly the same location, not high or anything in the graph. So period of sine and cosine, what was the period of sine and cosine graph? Sine x, cosine x. 2 pi. But what about tangent x? Pi. The graph shows it. It's pi. A little shorter than sine. This is a graph of tangent. You must um, sketch three strips. No reference points necessary, just this nice shape. And one more actually is this. Yes, go ahead. There are more, and I'm going to all specify it in that detail module. But this is a graph of tangent. One more thing I want you to sketch it here is the following. Is the line y equals x. Line y, line y equals x. How is this the central component compared with the y, line y equals x is interesting. And the quality of the how they intersect each other is actually studied in the calculus. So I cannot rigorously argue here, but I can just explain what that is. There's y equals x looks exactly like that. And what is happening just around the neighborhood or in the origin is just like almost becoming identical copy. But as soon as you pass that, as soon as you pass that part, the sign becomes the below of this y equals x, same line y equals x. Okay? Whenever this happens, we say it's a point of inflection. Some there line, um, one moment um, curve is staying above that line, and next moment to the left, below the line. Something is, we call it a concavity. Concavity is a switch around, is a moment of point of inflection. These are, are rigorously defined in the calculus courses, but I think you can still appreciate how you know how things are going on in here, All right? So I want you to sketch y equals x, absolutely with a dotted line. Make sure you sketch your tangent above y equals x in one po component, and below y equals x next component. And the rest of the thing is a copy, so you don't have to do anything else to that point. Just that y equals x there, and make sure you sketch it correctly in the neighborhood around the zero. Is that okay? This is what you have to do. One calls guide line y equals x. Or later you will see this becomes the same line y equals x becomes axis of reflection. That's the answer for tangent. So we know how to sketch sine, cosine, coming from the motion. Tangent, you have to look at this long bar. Think about the slope. How I, you know, what happened to slope as I go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2? and think about slope and then you can probably reproduce it and remember how it compares with y equals x. Any question? All right. Now next one is also part of the quiz problem is uh, graphs of inverse function. Now when we talk about function you Input is always x, output is always y. But just for this beginning part, I'm going to use a typical letter that represents the context um, correctly. Now sine y, not sine y, sine inverse, right? Sine inverse, what are you going to plug in? What letter is a good here? Not t, but the y coordinate. All right? Y coordinate. This represents. The whole thing will represent the angle 
for which the y coordinate is y given in there. All right. So this sine inverse thing, whatever the y is there, is supposed to be angle. All right. Whenever the function is introduced, the most thing that students are interested in is that how do you compute that? That's what students want to know. But mathematicians always think about the following thing first. If this is a function, what is the thing is allowed in there? Can I just plug in anything in there in, in y and think about the value of sine inverse? No. These are supposed to be y coordinate on where? In the unicircle. This comes from unicircle, right? So if it came from the unicircle, it must be on the unicircle. So what kind of y-coordinate do you see in the unicircle? As large as the North Pole, y-coordinate? One, as you go around, the South Pole, y-coordinate? Negative one, right? If you look around the circle, there is no point where the y-coordinate is exceeding this range. Range is not a good word. It's just interval, All right? So what happens if you plug in 1.2 and hit sine inverse in, in calculator? You get an error message, right? There's no such angle. All around angle must be one of the y coordinates on the circle. So these are the what is allowed to put in here in sine inverse. What is the technical name for that? Collection of uh, allowed input. There's a D word in there. Right? What of this function sine inverse y is this number usually represented by interval from negative one to positive one domain is the correct word domain domain of a function means what kind of values am i allowed to put in to this thing before you even calculate right that is called a domain so this you're supposed to state what is the domain of sine inverse and then you write negative one to positive one does that make sense all right. Then what is so that's what you're allowed, you you put it in there. How do you calculate it? Of course we use a calculator. Boom boom boom, right? But what kind of angle do you get after you hit sine inverse? You're not going to get 120. By hitting a sine inverse, you will never get 120 out of calculator. They only give you what kind of angles? Acute. But it could be negative as well. So the answer is negative 90 to positive 90. Don't write that down. Negative 90 to positive 90. Because between negative 90 to positive 90, these are the first quadrant, that's the fourth quadrant, right? What happened to y-coordinate? Y-coordinate never repeats. It was a positive y-coordinate up there, negative y-coordinate down there, right? So because y-coordinate never repeats, that's, that's why they're, they're choosing. There's an uh, angle for that so that we have one-to-one -one correspondence but we're out of that angle world right what is a good number to put it here instead of 90 it has to be this number and this is not really angle it's a real number like 1.5 something that's what this number is it's going to be used as magnitude of something all right now you're allowed only to put an input value between one and negative one put it in there, you're not going to get anything outside this pi over 2 or negative pi over 2. This is all you're going to get. So what is this thing called? Negative pi over 2 is pi over 2 is all you're going to get out of this function. Range is a correct term. So you'll be asked, what is the range of sine inverse? And then you state this one. You don't have to explain anything. But I hope you have a chance to think about this one more time and understand the principle and ha, these are the angle value and these are the value. All right, in the test, in the quiz, I'm not going to use y. Input's always x, output is always y. I'm just doing that to help you to understand the meaning of sine inverse. Once you pass that, um, the dummy variable x and y is the input and output. Okay? What do you think I'm going to do next? Cosine, right? Cosine inverse. Here's a cosine inverse. So what's a good letter inside there? X. 
I have an x coordinate, I want that angle. That angle is represented by this whole notation. Again, now we want to look at it as a not just as a notation, uh, we want to look at this cosine inverse as a function. Okay, so what kind of x value is allowed here? x coordinate on the unit circle, right? Go far to the right, what do you get? 1 on the unit circle, on the unit circle, all far to the right. And far to the left, negative 1. This is all you're going to get, you know. Just go around the circle and quickly understand this. All right, so what's the statement here? Domain, that's right. Domain of what function? Cosine inverse of x is negative 1 to positive 1. So let's do it again. Cosine inverse is supposed to be angle, right? Angle. Um, yeah, they want to choose an angle so that you have a unique x values. Never repeat. If you look at first and the fourth quadrant, do you think x value repeats? Here maybe x one half and there x one half, right? So it repeats. So there are two angles that gives you the same x. And we want to choose one. That's what this one is about. Calculator will give you only one angle. So they didn't choose first and second, qu fourth quadrant, right? But they chose first and second quadrant, where x coordinate never repeats. It started positive, go around, become negative. So given x value, there's only one angle correspondence. This idea is called one to one function being one to one even in that small range. So what do you get? As small as angle zero all the way up to pi, right? But this is not really angle, remember? It's just a number. So what do you say? The range of cosine inverse x is 0 to pi, thank you. That's all you're going to get from the calculator. All right? When the function is introduced in this, in just a mathematical context, this is something that mathematicians have to think about. The domain is usually easy, the range is not. In general, I give you a function, you understand perfectly what kind of values are allowed to put it in there, and what kind of value you get out, uh, out of it is very difficult calculation in general. And that is something you learn in calculus. But here, simple function, relatively <laughs> geometrically simple function, so that we can we can say things like this. All right, let's do one more. What is it? Right, tangent. Why do I think it's weird? I don't know. Tangent inverse of what letter? Y over X in one letter? What was it? Oh, yeah. M. Yeah. Slope. I give you slope. You think about the angle, it gives a slope. Um, we didn't think about this at all. So they have to I think I we did, actually we did. So what is a good range? Here's a positive slope, agree? That first quadrant positive slope. Over here, slope positive and negative. Think about the line here, line like this. Negative slope, positive slope. Negative slope. Right? How about over here? Kind of the same direction, still negative. They didn't choose first and second quadrant. They chose first and the fourth quadrant. Do you know why? Because in between the first and the second quadrant, there is this y axis. What is wrong with y axis? This is where t equals pi over 2, right? What happened to the pi over 2 is slope. Undefined. So it's in the middle of it, although it covers. It's kind of break in there, so they didn't like it. So they chose this range. Let's look at this boundary line here. What is the slope of that line? T equals 0. Horizontal. 0, right? So that's all right. So that's what they chose. So m is going to be, well, first of all, what kind of, that's, the, the opposite, actually. It's, it's going to give you pi over 2. The calculator will give you pi over 2, negative pi over 2. 
But tangent is not defined at pi over 2, remember? Therefore, you can't say this equal to. It's always slightly less. Remember that in the vertical strip? Nothing really is over a pi over 2. So you're not going to get pi over 2. How about m? This is tricky. What kind of slope are you going to get by going around all that? x coordinate on the circle, you get everything in between 1 and negative 1. y coordinate 1 and negative 1, right? Go around the circle, wherever you want to go. What happened to slope? We have 0, right? We have sin 1. 45, right? How about 2015? You see 2015? Slope 2015? You don't see it? It's almost vertical, right? You know, run one unit and go 2015 units above. 2015 feet above. Think about that line. It's pretty steep, right? That's right there. Right? So you can't really distinguish it here. <laughs> vertical is 2015 or 2015 raised to 2015 power. It's going to all look vertical to us. But that subtle thing dramatically increases slope. So what kind of slope you get go around all the circle? Negative infinity to positive infinity. You get everything. So here's the negative infinity to positive infinity. That's what you're going to get. You're allowed to put any number in the tangent inverse. Doesn't matter how large you put it in there, then the calculator will calculate it for you, tangent inverse of something. Right? If it doesn't exceed the capability of handling the number <laughs> calculator. All right? So if you put tangent inverse of 2015, then it's going to say 89.2 or something like that. Something close to 90 degree. Or real number that is close to pi over 2. So let's sum that up. Domain of tangent inverse of m is interval notation, right? Negative infinity to positive infinity. Is that alright? How about the range of tangent infinity uh, tangent inverse is negative pi over two, positive pi over two. This time we have to use open parenthesis there. Correct? So that um, indicating that you're not gonna get pi over two, never, but something close to pi over 2, like 89.99 degree. All right, it goes like this. State the domains and range of ranges of sine inverse, cosine inverse, and tangent inverse, period. And then you state like this. That's all you have to state. You don't have to explain anything. But in the process of pre preparing this, I hope you go through the thoughts and idea that I explain that and you end up at understanding this. Is that alright? Alright, that's that. Any questions so far? This one here? Yeah. It's alright, but you don't have like 20 minutes or anything. You have a very short period of time to finish this. So just uh, think about it, but you know, state it like this and concisely. Is that alright? That's not it. We're going to now sketch the graph of these function. Sine inverse. We sketched the sine cosine tangent now. We're going to sketch sine inverse, cosine inverse, and tangent inverse. Then I'm going to introduce the general principle of inverse function. Sketching the graph of inverse function. So, <coughs> graph of inverse, the general discussion, and some detailed calculation of this one is introduced very nicely explained in chapter 3 where it, it discusses the functions in general, chapter 3. But here, I'd like to explain to you in this way. Here's y-axis and here's x-axis. And here's a point a comma b. And I'm only showing that portion of the graph. This is a graph of y equals f of x, no matter what that function is. It could be sine and cosine. Any function like that. The point, the fact that point A comma B is on this graph, it means A is sent to B as we apply the function f in there. This is also concisely, um, to, you know, denoted like this: f of A is B. 
it's not you multiplying f to a. You have an input a, you go through some sort of procedure called f, called function, and then your output is b. That's how it's denoted. <coughs> right? I understand that. How about inverse? What does inverse do? Inverse sends b back to where? A. That's what inverse does. If the original function sent 1 to 2, inverse function is going to send 2 back to 1. Right? It's really easy to think of it, but to get the formula of doing this is almost impossible to figure out. <coughs> so this is called inverse function. F superscript negative 1. Again, it's not reciprocal. It is just the idea of reversing the process. F inverse negative 1. It's not the reciprocal. All right. So if there is something else that also mapped to B, then when you reverse B, then you have to think about, is it going to go to A or going to A to A prime? Weird, right? Function should go to one value. So if it is like this, it's very inconvenient. So that's why we require function to be, what is it? One to one. There's no two value we map into one. So this never happens for the functions we consider for inverse. <coughs> if not, then there's only one value, so it makes perfect sense. So the graph of f of uh, y equals f of x says a comma b, right? a is input and b is output. What about f inverse of x? What is input here for f inverse? Input is b, right? What is output? a. So if a comma b is in the graph of y equals f of x, B comma A, if you swap that around, and that's going to be the part of the graph of inverse function we try to sketch. Does that make sense? So, next thing we have to do, all these things explained in the chapter 3. If A, pay, A, A comma B is over here, is there a nice description, without knowing what these numbers are, is there a nice description that explain where this B comma A is? Right? So here's the description. There's this universal line of reflection. Remember this line? What was this line? Y equals x, that's right. There's this y equals x for all the function in the whole world, and you reflect it. There's this point a comma b, right? Where's b comma a? You have to go perpendicular and cross your line of reflection and go about exact same distance and arrive it there. What is the coordinate of this one? B comma A. Okay? That's the fact. And they compute the slope of this line perpendicular and use negative reciprocal midpoint formula to give a very clean and elegant proof of that B comma A and A comma B, these two points is in this relationship, then you know that must be the reflection. All right? So what we are going to do is we're going to look at the sine of x in the you know limited range, and we're going to take those reference points and you swap those x and y coordinates the reference points. Then it's going to reveal the shape. Make sense? You don't have to do any of those in your answer, just to sketch the final picture. I'm showing you the process of getting to uh, sine inverse and cosine inverse. All right. Here is our um, sine graph again. I am using um, T n. What coordinate for sine? Y, right? So here is um, y equals sine t. All right. For the inverse, um, what kind of angle we looked at? Remember, angle we looked at? Sine inverse, what angle does that give you? Hmm? Sine inverse of y, what is, that's supposed to be the angles, right? Sine inverse of y, does, what kind of angle does the calculator give you? Negative 9 to positive 90 in radian, negative pi over 2, positive pi over 2, right? So here is a positive pi over 2. 
here is negative pi over 2. And remember, this is not sine inverse. This is just the sine, right? And we're just going to... I'm going to pretend this horizontal axis should be a little bit more exaggerated. It's easier to sketch. Not like that. This is supposed to be a graph of sine. You know what happened in pi over 2? Graph of sine? That's the peak point, right? Amplitude. Think about the reference point. So this is how it looks like. Around 0, 0, the sine graph looks almost like y equals x. So I'm going to sketch just like y equals x a little bit and begin to turn a little bit. Bend around and go horizontal. By the time it enters this peak point, it becomes horizontal almost. All right? And the other one, negative pi over 2, that's the lowest amplitude point. Remember that part? Yeah. And it stays almost y equals x. And um, sudden is tons. Simply just erase that. Almost horizontal. That's the portion of a sine graph. And it continues up and down, right? Remember that part? But we truncate it like this. Pi over 2, negative pi over 2. Does this pass horizontal line test? This just this segment. It does pass horizontal line test, right? But if I include the wiggly part in here and there, it does not pass horizontal line test. If the function passes horizontal line test, what is it called? The function is? It's a compound adjective. One to one. Right? There's no two values. Within this range, there's no two value mapped into the same y value. But if it is wider range, you can see there are lots of value going to the same value. So they chose it this one. So angle and y coordinate has a one to one correspondence. There is no repeat. That's the reason why they chose. All right? Now we're going to actually identify the coordinates of, of this one. What is the coordinate here? Pi over 2. How about y coordinate? 1. That's the highest amplitude line is hitting, remember? So what about this guy? Negative pi over 2, negative 1. All right? So that's one thing that's going to help us to figure out where what happened as we flip this one, right? As you consider inverse. Another interesting part is that how this one compares with y equals x. Remember y equals x, that's axis of reflection for the inverse function. And this fact that you're going to learn in calculus is that just like the tangent case, this y equals x is almost became same around the neighborhood of 0, it's become a 0, and switches location, I mean relative position. Before sine was below the axis, right? And right after you pass this 0 comma 0, the sine stays above the axis of reflection. This is a very subtle thing that's going on here. And by just looking at calculator or, you know, graph, you will never get a correct conclusion. So you have to go through very, very interesting calculation to understand what is happening to that. But this is a fact going like this. As you reflect it, you see that one go across to y equals x. Remember that part? So as you reflect this graph, that's going to be the inverse. Now that portion in the first quadrant is going to above y equals x. All right? And the other one in the third quadrant is going to be below y coordinate. So let's sketch it. Unfortunately, I'm going to keep this T and Y, and this is going to be the graph of Y equals the sine inverse T. Here, T is just a dummy variable, Y is a dummy variable, not really representing the context of unicircle. Okay? All you have to do is sketch. This line, what is this line? Y equals X. Now you start with a zero. What happened to that portion there? Stays above. Okay? Stays above. So this enters horizontally, right? 
as you enter the endpoint. This time it's going to enter vertically because if you flip it. So you're going to sketch it like that. You stay almost at y equals x, but, but become above and enter vertically like that. And most importantly, you have to identify this point. What is this point? Can somebody go for this point right there? 1, comma, pi over 2. Thank you. That coordinate, two, 2 pi over 2, comma, 1, becomes 1, comma, pi over 2. All right, you look at this portion here, and it stays almost on the y equals x, but symmetrically and enter vertically like that, and but stay below. What about, what about this guy here? Negative 1, negative pi over 2. This you have to stay. Look at here. This function, x values are between 1 and negative 1. You see that? 1 and negative 1? Wasn't that the domain of sine inverse? How about this guy over here? That's the range. That's the pi over 2 there and negative pi over 2 down there. And that's what we have found before. All right, so this should be sketched in your quiz 3.1. The graph of y equals sine inverse t. This y equals x line, and do this above and below thing correctly, and identify these points. Okay? Any question? So what do we do next? Yes. Um, that should be consistent with something that you have stated already. So prior to that, I'm going to ask you to state the domain and ranges of three inverse functions. So after you sketch it, you can easily say, ah, that's, uh, that is consistent with what you have stated above. Make sense? Cosine. Let's do cosine. Somebody explain why am I doing this more horizontally here? That's x, right? This is going to be a graph of x equals cosine t. Now for cosine inverse, what kind of angle did we look at? Cosine inverse of x. What angle do you get? Cosine inverse? Zero to one eighty, but it's zero to pi here, right? Zero to pi. So we're gonna I'm gonna put pi over here. Is that all right? So now let's sketch the cosine up to pi. So here's one. And that start at one, and it passes through pi over two like that. Remember? Pi over two. And then go below and hit negative one and enter that last point horizontally almost like horizontal line. So that's the portion of graph y equals x equals cosine t over 0 to pi. Does this pass horizontal line test? Yeah. So that's the part is one-to-one -one correspondent. Angle and the x-coordinate is one-to-one -one correspondent. If you go outside of this one, the, the it begin to repeat. So they cut it out like this so that there's one-to-one -one correspondence. Then just for this portion, we can consider inverse function. So for the cosine t, you don't have to put the guideline y equals x. That doesn't really help to see what's going on. All right? So that you don't need that y equals x line here. But the coordinate will be sufficient. So I'm going to go ahead and figure out the coordinate here. What is the coordinate here? 0, 1. How about this point? I'm a zero and that point here. Pi is pi negative one down there, right? Make sense? Y coordinate is ne negative one. All right. Okay. Now, what do we do about these points? To get the inverse, you swap x and y, right? So I'm just going to write down, if I swap x and y, I'm going to go 1 comma 0, right? How about this one? 0 comma pi over 2, is that right? This one? Negative 1 comma pi. So we're going to sketch these three points 
in the new coordinate plane and try to go through this in the same fashion. Right? All right, here it is. You see this is relatively more horizontally stretched picture, expanded picture, right? If you switch the role of X and Y, it's going to be a more vertically stretched picture. So you have to sketch it more vertically um, expanded version in here. Does that make sense? I'm not switching X and Y, it's just staying like this. All right, there are three points we identified. What is the f first point? One comma zero, right? So we're going to put one comma zero here. You see what I'm doing? One comma zero? Where did one comma zero come from? Zero comma one swapped around, right? Second point, zero comma zero is here pi over two. You can put pi over two somewhere here. That is uh, zero comma pi over two. And you have to write that, zero comma pi over two there. What is the third point? Negative one comma pi. This is negative one comma pi. It's roughly here. Is that right? Those are the three points. If you swap an x and y, it goes like this. Any questions so far? So here's how you're going to sketch it. If you look at the, the motion, it leaves this initial position like horizontally. If you look into it, it's almost horizontal and bend down. And here, it becomes a vertical. So you're going to leave most like vertically upward toward to that the other two points. All right? Is horizontally leaving and bend it down. Is vertically leaving and bend it down as we reflect it. Then you you stay horizontal like this, and you have to bend it down to the next point. We got to get there, right? Is that right? You enter the second point with almost slope negative one there. And continue, when you go to arrive the last point here, it becomes almost horizontal, but here's almost vertical. So you continue like that, and when you enter last point, you have to change vertically like this and enter like this. That's the graph. Yes? All right. This is graph of x equals what? Cosine inverse of t. Right. Don't get confused by the role of this x and t here. It's just a dummy variable in the, at this stage. That's it. You don't have to do the line of reflection here. Make sense? All right. That's you remember's tangent. Tangent graph. Here's the. Is more vertically stretched, if you remember. Here is uh, M. Here is um, T. There was this vertical dotted line. Anybody remember anything about this line? Was it T equals what value? Where the slope M is undefined? Pi over 2. The other angle? equals negative pi over 2, right? All right? And there was this nice line that, remember, that y equals x? Remember that part? And ten, uh, this tangent stay above or below this one, around this 0. So here's 0 and above, right? Sine was below, remember? Sine was below, a tangent is above tangent stays almost to the part of you know y equals x and then begin to lift up and go rapidly towards infinity like that all right in the neck to the left stay below stay a little bit just like y equals x and bend it down towards infinity that's the graph all right Tangent inverse. Everybody remember about angle you're going to get from tangent inverse? 
was a negative 90 to positive 90. Calculator will only give you that angle. Negative 90 to positive 90. Outside, it begins to repeat again. So, this time we get rid of all the other strip. Just look at the central strip. This is, do you think that passes horizontal line test? So, between that angle, pi and negative pi over 2, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with this T and M. There's one-to-one -one correspondence. So, we can flip it. Um, no reference points necessary. Just think about what's going to happen to this vertical line as we swap x and y coordinate. What do you think is going to happen to vertical line? These two vertical asymptotes. Any idea? Horizontal. Yeah, horizontal. All right. So what are we going to do? We're going to sketch that long horizontal line, right? So here's the horizontal line. What is this horizontal line? Horizontal line it goes like y equals something, right? What do you think it is? T value was here. And they switched, everything is switched, right? T is becoming Y and Y becoming T. So T becoming Y, the Y equals pi over 2. Hope that makes sense. You can just uh, look at some of the points that is quite close to um, horizontal asymptote to understand this. Down here is Y equals negative pi over 2, right? So you have to write that down. Top horizontal, this is not amplitude line, this top horizontal asymptotes, y equals pi over 2, bottom horizontal at, um, asymptote, y equals negative pi over 2. And because it's reflected around y equals x, it's still wise thing to do is sketch this y equals x right there, 45 degree. Okay? Now how was it before? This portion right here, stay above y equals x, right? What's going to happen? stay below y equals x but at the beginning you make it almost like the portion of graph y equals x like that and then stay below by bending it down and then go to horizontal asymptote like that all right now in the th a third quadrant portion was stay below y equals x and it becomes above so make another portion like that almost y equals x and then bend it to get to um, horizontal asymptote. And this is a graph of what? Tangent inverse t. You see that t values are stretched all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? That's the domain. What is the range of tangent inverse? Strictly less than pi over 2, strictly greater than negative pi over 2. That is indicated by this dotted line and asymptote phenomena. This inverse function begin to show up in later semesters, not in this semester, if you go on to mathematics and then you have forgotten all the trigonometry and all of a sudden out of nowhere the solution must be inverse tangent. Just pops out of nowhere. There's no triangle, no harmonic motion. You're just looking at very innocent function and you're calculating in the calculus the answer must be tangent inverse. Just amazing that how using this idea you can write down kind of patterns of a pi and things like that. There's beautiful things about the application of inverse in physics, differential equation, all that. Um, all right. Whenever you later and you enter in the calculus the mechanical you know machinery of this inverse thing in the calculus and if you think about what this is about on you know behind it, it it's it's better than just just accepting the formula and manipulation it mean, means nothing to you probably but if you think about it where it comes from and then later to connect to the situation where it rises as a solution of something that's completely unrelated and it's, it's quite interesting. So you will see this, especially tangent inverse, a lot. Tangent inverse shows up a lot. 
forgot to box it. So that's going to be that. So how